Welcome to another recorded lecture of the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikolsky and I'm the teacher and coordinator of this course. In the first part of the course, we learn an analytic method called text word theory, which we then use to analyze literature from the Middle East. We follow the introductory book describing this theory, which is called Text World Theory and Introduction, written by Joanna Gavins. And we then use this approach to analyze short stories from the book Gaza Writes Back by Rifat al Arir. You can find links to the books in the descriptions in the description below. In the second part of the course, we focus on identity issues in Palestinian society. Today we learn chapters three and four of the book Textual Theory and Introduction by Joanna Gavins. Chapter three talks about scenes and chapter four talks about processes. So I will first describe or summarize these two chapters, then as usual, analyze stories, and I will end by the assignment for this week. So let's start with chapter three, scenes. In the previous chapter, we talked about text world and imagined reality created in the mind of a listener or a reader as a result of a text said or written by a co-participant in the discourse world, the teller or the author. This communication is one between two or more willful participants done for the purpose of transferring knowledge from the teller to the listener. The area of communication, so to speak, is called discourse world. The basic model of communication is between at least two people in a discourse world who talk to each other. They are therefore aware of their environment and know what is in it, as well as who each of them is. Not that they necessarily know each other personally and are aware of gestures and intonations in the speech. But textual communication can happen also when the participants in a discourse world are not at the same place, such as talking on a phone, or not even at the same time when they listen to a recording or read a text written by the other. And then we talk about a split discourse world. This course, which is dedicated to literature, will only relate to split discourse world as written literature always is. Chapter three of the book, Textual Theory and Introduction, talks about how the text, the text written by an author in this case, creates scenes in the text world of the reader. The meaning of scenes here is similar to what environment is in non-split discourse world. Naturally, this is very important. This is recognizing the scene is naturally a very important first step in a split discourse communication, since the readers have no idea what the environment of the text world is because the co-participants are not in the same place or even time. Once a scene is laid out, the readers can transport themselves, so to speak, into the text world. This is called projection in text world theory terms. Creating the scene in the text world is done by presenting the reader with world building elements that clarify to the reader what is there in a world that is relevant to the central person of the story. The central person of the story could be the teller, if the story is in the first person, and if the story is in a third person, or like a teller is telling or, or about another person, uh, it is the world that is relevant to this person, to the protagonist. These elements hold true as long as the story is in the same scene. And when it moves away from there, a new scene has to be established with its new world building elements. Overall, the scene is seen from the viewpoint of the protagonist, even though other voices might be heard later on in the text, as we will see in later chapters. Therefore, the world building elements are related to this person, to the teller in the first person or a character. And so the elements are described 
in their relations to this person. The person who is at the center, the one with the point of view, is called origo in linguistic terms. The issue of relation to a person is called deixis, from the Greek word which means to point out or to show. There is something that is called deictic studies, which studies how space and time are created using speech. Because if you think about it, it this is not self-evident. Space and time are things that uh, one experiences in life, in the real world. How can it be translated or transferred into an imaginary life uh, in the mind of someone who does not experience in real life the time and space in question? It is actually a pretty big deal that this is possible, and it is human language that enables this. The person to whom the world building elements are related is indicated here by uh, the I. Uh, as you can see, the environment is described in relation to the, this point of view up, down, behind, or in front, close and far or uh, distant. As you can also see, from this figure is that the mind uses spatial concepts to create the mental world of time. We think of the past time as behind us while the future is in front of us and the present is here. To designate these realities, to describe place, we use or we can use location names such as Groningen or we can use spatial words like here, there, far away, close, etc. These words evoke in our mind or in the mind of the hearer a text world of the location indicated or an environment in relation to the origo, which we also invoke in the text world. The demonstratives teach us how far from the origo is a certain object and a type of motion can also help us create the space where these motions occur, uh, such as entering would indicate a cl closed space with an entrance or running an open large space, uh, etc. Time is indicated by words as well, uh, as we saw. Words of space are used to refer to time. We use temporal parameters such as uh, three years ago, with which we use the preposition in borrowed from the space semantic field of a container to, in to indicate time. Temporal adverbs are in relation to the origos now, and we use tenses to order events and actions on a temporal line, line being again borrowed from the space vocabulary. Textual theory has developed a system to describe information in a form of a diagram or a table. It begins in this manner. This table describes the basic, the initial text world of the story, thus the heading text world. The first section of the table spells out the world building elements. Here we have time, which is now. Uh, the now of my delivering this lecture and unlike normal years uh, where the lecture is given in the class this year we are in a split discourse world so the time of my recording this lecture will not be the now of your listening to it so you will be projecting yourselves into the time of my speaking to you as for the place i'm talking to you from my office at home so when listening to this lecture, you will be projecting to this place as well. Here are two other topics that are world-building elements. One is objects in the environment of, uh, of the origo. These help construct the text world relevant for the story by calling out elements familiar to the reader from their personal experience. Here we find natural objects such as rain or wind and or human-made ones, such as a field, a room, or a flag. The world-building elements at the bottom here indicate a cultural context. 
these are objects that point to the cultural identity of the text world, an identity which is not a role in society, but belonging to a group. This is how we add these elements to our description of the world building elements in the table. We make a separate section objects, uh, and this makes the text world uh, we create about the story much more details. Here I added electricity, balcony, and ball as examples of objects, as the, these will uh, come up in the opening lines of the story that we will read soon. The social environment. Uh, here we talk about uh, agents, people who are part of the world of the story. The text world created in the listener or the reader. These have a different status from the objects, of course, and they are called enactors in text world theory terms. These are personalities, people or other personified beings that take part in the story as such. It could be that people or, or animals will only be part of the environment and then they are not enactors, but more of objects as unpleasant as this sounds. Let us apply what we have learned so far on the story spared from the anthology Gaza Writes Back. The story is written by uh, Rawan Yaghi, very well written about a child who sees his friends playing in a yard while he is not allowed to go out to play. Here is how it starts. The electricity was out. There was no setting to do and we were bored of staying at home. My neighbors and my friends went out for a football match. I wasn't allowed out, because my mother was preparing lunch and it was almost done. I stood on the balcony, watching my friends kicking the ball to each other and acting like famous football players when they scored a goal, spreading their arms like eagles and running around screaming, GOAL! Let us look at how the world-building elements are represented in the text world theory system. So in the world building elements uh, section, we have the, the time is the past tense, something that happened in the past. The location is the teller's home on the balcony. The objects that make up the uh, Origo's world are the electricity, uh, the studying, and the football match, the lunch, and the ball is particularly detailed. The enactors are the teller, the I of the story, his mother, and the neighbors and friends uh, that are at this point mentioned together. We can feel that such a description is missing something, that the objects and people lie there lifeless. There are two major categories of elements that bring life to the world building elements. The one is the relationships between them, uh, what is next to what, um, where, where things are, etc. And the second category is action, actions that are performed by enactors on the objects. The latter, that is the actions, are called in textual theory terms processes and we will talk about them in the next chapter. Here we will talk about uh, what is called relational processes, which talks more about the attributes of the elements uh, that we saw so far. So relational processes, uh, we have three types, the intensive, when one thing is something, the possessive, uh, as it sounds, when one thing has something, uh, and the circumstantial, when one thing is located in a relationship to another thing. So once the spatial and temporal locations are established and the objects and, and actors are called into being, other knowledge frames are attached to these items, which enables to have more details when building the scene. And these are indicated, these relational processes are indicated with a horizontal arrow. So the electricity is out, yeah, an intensive um, relational process. Studying does not exist, again an intensive. Lunch 
is almost done, also intensive. The mother is in the kitchen, so this is a circumstantial uh, relational process. And the I person is on the balcony, again, a, a circumstantial relational process. I put in parentheses processes which are not relational, of which we will speak later, and left the, the few relational ones we have uh, regarding the uh, enactors and the objects. So but the idea is not for you to memorize all the types of the relational processes, but to be able to sketch for yourselves when you are studying a story, what are the opening conditions of the scene? the situation from which the story begins. Here is a little summary of what we learned uh, about Dexis uh, so far with a nice picture from uh, Wikipedia. So Dexis has to do with the relation to a person or a persona, the origo, who is the I of the here and now of the language. First person narrator uh, of the story, but in a in a text, this persona could be designated in a third person, uh, although the reader-listener assumed that this is the person with the point of view of the I. The dexis relates first to the spatial environment, here, there, far, near, and time is then conceptualized in a similar manner, where the future is in front and the past is at the back, using words such as uh, before or after. There are ge geographical markers such as the desert, as you can see here, and cultural ones such as the hijab. This deictic information is laid out for the reader in the beginning of the story or at whatever other time the author sees fit when the scene changes, and it helps the reader create in their mind a text world, a scene, from which the story will start to roll until it reaches another scene, which will be laid out and the story continues from there, etc. The time persists throughout the scene. It not necessarily stands or stops, but it advances continuously as the dexis moves from one place to the other. This is within one scene. If the scene changes, as I said, uh, the whole thing begins again. And this situation, that is the continuity of time, enables something, the description of which is characteristic to textual theory and which enriches the environment, the, the scene of the text world, without making any movement in the story yet. But it could also happen within the story, not only in the stages of the world building elements. It is, some, it is something that happens outside the time frame of the scene. And it is called a world switch in textual theory. Here is what Govins uh, says about this. Word switches occur whenever the temporal boundaries of a text world shift, causing the discourse participants to construct a new text world through which the distinct time zone can be conceptualized. The spatial location of the new text world could shift as well, or could remain the same as its original text world, but readers are now aware of the presence, however vague, of another temporal setting containing a different set of world building elements, time, place, objects, and, and actors. Gavin talks here about the example she studies in her book. The example is the number one ladies detective agency by Alexander McCall Smith. Let us look at the example that we are studying today, the story spared by Rawa Yaghi. We have one world switch in the scene we saw from the story spared. It is here, describing what the teller friends are doing when they score a goal. They are acting like famous football players when they scro score a goal. 
spreading their arms like eagles and running around screaming goal. I assume that what is meant is something like this. The word when in the phrase when they scored a goal introduces a new time zone, different from the original scene. The scene is in the now of the story. The famous players are in a collective general time of when they, the collective group of famous players, score or soon after. This immediate, immediately makes the reader create a new text world of a collective, perhaps famous players running and shouting after scoring. Let us see how this is indicated in a textual theory table. There is an indicator in the original world building elements table and it connects to the new text world that is created. Here I put it in a box and copied the text into the new uh, text world. But it is actually a complete text world of its own and deserve its own description like we see here and then we call it text world 2. The text world are given numbers so uh, we can relate to them without confusing them with the original text world. The recognition and the method of describing new text world that emer emerge throughout the story is a very useful tool to point to how the author builds the reality of the people in the story. Here, the image of the world famous football, actually it is soccer, players tells us about the environment of the children. Obviously they are not these players, they probably only know them from television, but they dream of being like these uh, famous uh, players. So it is a very rich tool for the author and a rich tool for us as people analyzing the story to indicate the reality and as a result the identity of the people. We have here only one uh, example of a world switch. Uh, Gavins in her chapter uses an example with many more world switches. You can look at this in the book in chapter 3. So what we learned in this chapter is what are the world building elements and how to write them up for yourselves and what are the uh, and what are world switches and how to write these up and now for chapter four of text world theory and introduction which talks about processes <laughs> So in the context of chapter three, we talked about the world building elements that establish the text world. We also talked about relational processes that give more details about the world building elements and thus make the text world come more to life. Uh, more so even with world switches of which we also talked, which make the elements of the text world, especially of the enactors, richer, their inner world more clear to us and the information we have about it, uh, about them deeper. However, world switches are not the only way in which text world can develop and change. Even when they remain within the same time zone and spatial location, text world are subject to a constant process of evolution. So how does the text world evo evolve? This happens through what is called in text world terms processes. So processes are textual features that cause a text world to advance. They mark the relationship between the world builders, you know, the world building elements, and the actions or events that happen in the story. I have to add another uh, concept here. While processes is what advances the story as, as a concept. Uh, it is called in textual theory, function advancing proposition, which is a term taken from functional linguistics. And this is a linguistic approach that takes into account speakers and hearers side and their communicative needs. This is in contrast to linguistic formalism. 
So textual theory borrows this notion from functional linguistics. So function advancing proposition. There are many details about uh, these processes and many types of function advancing propositions. It is not the intention that you will learn all of them and uh, by heart and always very meticulously analyze anything, uh, any text that you see. But it is important that you have words to use if you need them. You can always resort to this lecture or better still to the book to find the correct terms uh, for what you want to say in terms of describing uh, processes and function advancing propositions. Essential division in processes or uh, function advancing propositions is into material and non-material ones. Non-material ones are very special in that we can only really know about them through language. So even if we can tell that a non-material process is going on in a person, we do not really know for sure what it is. Only language enables the person to tell about it or the teller in a story to tell about a character in the story. Material processes or material function advancing propositions are such that have a goal, not a goal as someone's intention, but a physical goal that is reached when one physical object or entity reaches or touches another, such as kicking, biting, or sitting. There is also a distinction between action and events, both within material processes, overall material actions or uh, processes or function advancing propositions are done by animate actors and events happen or are done by inanimate ones. So what we saw before, kicking, biting, sitting, all are actions, uh, while breaking, uh, falling, uh, standing, when these are by inanimate objects, they are events. So processes are essentially what happens to the world building elements of the story. We saw in the previous chapter that uh, relational processes, they are att attributes of these elements uh, of, which, uh, of which we learn even before the story begins. They, together with the world switches, as uh, we, I keep saying, elaborate on the world building elements and they deepen and expand our knowledge of them. The more knowledge we have, the more focused we are on that element of which we uh, know more, but we'll talk about this a little bit later. Fun function advancing propositions are processes that move the story on. Even though the scene, de the scene develops, it is not changed, nor does the time jump away from its course. So these are not world switches. I mean, function advancing propositions are not word switches. They are making up the story, the plot of the story. The function advancing propositions are not a single word or, or necessarily a verb, but they are a whole phrase in which the action is indicated, indeed, usually by a verb, uh, which is embedded in a phrase. We follow the action, material or non-material, which the protagonist does or is happening to the protagonist or to other people in the story, and this has relevance to the protagonist, or we follow events that happen which have relevance for the protagonist. The whole story is actually about the protagonist. Yes, this is always the case. The manner in which actions and events are described has influence on how the reader perceives it. So it's not the action itself, it is also how it is described. So the, the way that it is described has a, an influence on the text world which is being created. Consider these two uh, sentences. Uh, the gazelle ran very fast, or the gazelle barely escaped. Each of these is describing the same action, more or less, 
but it creates a completely different uh, text world. So for a final word about function advancing propositions, the function advancing propositions are the majority of the text, while the world builders, the world, world building elements are the majority of the opening moments of the text. So the world builders move the, to the background once the story advances with the function advancing propositions and the actors, the protagonist comes to the fore of the story. How to indicate the function advancing propositions in the textual theory diagrams. So indicating function advancing propositions is done using vertical arrows pointing downward. These indicate sentences or phrases that communicate an action or an event. And these are brought about because they move the story forward. Gavins analyzes a soccer match in this chapter, and thus the di diagram reflects this. Let us look at it a bit closer. Here, we see many actions that happen in a text. These happen to the world building elements and they advance the story. So if we look back at the world building elements, as we see here, she specified these earlier, we see an actors with relational processes. For example, Darren Deadman is the referee. The second an actor in the diagram here. Being a referee is indicated by the horizontal arrow. Then we see the function advancing proposition already there in the uh, world building um, elements. He kicks off toward Dave Bowen's tent. Yeah, so he starts the, the soccer match. So looking again at the next section of, uh, of the diagram, here we only see the function advancing proposition. For example, ball drops on Danny Bullman who heads it across. This is one um, part of the story. And then Josh Lowe attacks down the near side, then runs off the ball, and then fouls the defender. And then Northampton, they get the ball away. And then the commentator and Leroy, whoever that is, rise to their feet, apparently with excitement. So if one knows what is being talked about here, one gets a pretty good picture of what happens in a game when, the, uh, when studying this textual theory diagram. So let's move now to applying this to the Gaza rights back. So how do we mark for function advancing propositions in the story spared. So let, let's ap apply what we have learned to the story spared by Rawan Yaghi from the anthology Gaza Writes Back. This is the beginning of the story with a child standing on the uh, balcony, looking at his friends playing downstairs, uh, pretending to be famous soccer players, and the mother making lunch in the kitchen. We saw uh, this table of world building elements with their re relational processes indicated by the horizontal arrows and the world switches, as we see here. Now let us look at the function advancing propositions in the next paragraph of the story. I stood there, cheering whenever my best friend, Ahmed, scored. Lunch seemed to take forever. I looked back. Mom was putting plates on the table. She looked at me and smiled serenely. She knew how much I wanted to go out and that I was staying because she made me. Come on, Mom. Hurry. Ahmed is scoring all the goals, I complained. Almost done, dear. You won't be able to play on an empty stomach, will you? She said sweetly. Let us start doing the technical work of the simple actions. 
an events here without any consideration of the higher meaning of this. These are the world building elements to which we had in the story, in the beginning of the story. And these are the things that are happening to them. So the I person, the teller, who is the protagonist, who is standing on the balcony, he is now complaining. Come on, mom, hurry. So this is a material process of saying and complaining. This is one function advancing uh, propositions. And then we have the mother who is in the kitchen making lunch. lunch. So she was putting plates on the table, which is a material process. And she looked at me and smiled, which is also a material process. She knew how much I wanted to go out. So this is a non-material process. That's a cognitive process. This is a cognitive uh, function advancing proposition of knowing she knew. And then she's saying almost done dear, sweetly. This is again a material process. So again, without uh, going very deeply into, uh, into the analysis, what is made clear here is the relationship between the mother and the son. It's much clearer now. The boy is very disturbed uh, by not being permitted to go out. We didn't know how much when we just saw him on the balcony, but now we know more. The mother knows it, but she tries to improve his feeling by speaking sweetly, uh, by using loving words like uh, dear and by reconciling the harsh demand she put on him with his wish to go out and play by saying you cannot play on an empty stomach. We are now expecting uh, the boy to eat and get out and play. Uh, there is one paragraph which I skipped. I want to go back to it now. Here it is. I, the teller, the protagonist standing on the balcony, is cheering whenever Ahmed scores. So this is a material process. Let's uh, consider this more closely now. We have a very obvious function advancing proposition. I stood. And then we have a description of how the boy stood cheering whenever Ahmed scored. This is a sort of relational process, not a new activity, but giving more details on how the teller stood, how the I person stood. But look at how much new knowledge we gain here. There's a new enactor, Ahmed, who is a very, uh, who is very positively depicted on two grounds. First, because he scored, and second, because he's the protagonist's best friend. Ahmad is being foregrounded now. He's becoming a very important character in the story. After reading this, we reinterpret what we knew before. It is not only the neighbors and friends that make uh, the boy want to go out uh, to play, it seems to be mainly Ahmed, his best friend, who is the reason behind this. So in this function advancing uh, proposition, we get new information uh, and the story begins to unfold when the main character, the protagonist, is still standing, which is what he already did in the uh, world building elements uh, section. So this is a very um, nice way for the author to start the story. It is time for your assignment now. Read the story Canary. You can find it in this week's uh, section on the uh, learning platform. Pick three scenes and make a diagram of the world building elements, word switches, and the first function advancing proposition you find in each of these. You can create the diagram uh, on the computer using Word or PowerPoint or any other program. Uh, you can draw it by hand and scan and or photograph it, the drawing and upload it to the learning platform. 
this is your uh, individual assignment. For the work in the group story, look at the first pages, one or two pages of your story and create a diagram of the world building elements world switches and function advancing propositions you find there. Submit your assignment, your individual assignment, in the assignment link found below this lecture. <laughs> Bye.